Um, welcome, everybody. I am Praveena Shukla, Associate Professor at Indiana University in the Folklore Department. Three years ago, at the American Folklore Society meeting in Bloomington, we debuted a new forum called Talking Folklore, a conversation with leaders in the field. Welcome to the fourth installment of that particular series. The purpose of the forum is to feature a small number of prominent and important folklorists chosen to exemplify and expound on a particular theme. Richard Dorson believed that if we asked every folklorist how she or he got interested in the field, we would gain much knowledge about the discipline of folklore and how it is practiced and envisioned by the people who find themselves within the discipline. We've heard most of these scholars talk about their research project, but this is a rare, wonderful opportunity for us to hear them talk about themselves and their own careers and lives. We are recording the session, and Curtis is doing it for us in the back. And once again, we will be depositing a transcript of this forum in the Collecting Memories Project archives of the American Folklore Society and Utah State University Special Collections and Archives. So again, we're not just doing this for our pleasure right now. We're making sure that this enters the record of the intellectual history of our discipline. The first Talking Folklore panel took place on the campus of Indiana University. And we focus on academic folklore by talking with former students or teachers at Indiana University. The second Talking Folklore panel in New Orleans featured the important work of folklorists in the public sector. We spoke with public folklorists who engaged with folklore in all of its forms, music, material, verbal, customary, and festivals. The third Talking Folklore panel in Providence highlighted folklorists engaged in international scholarship and fieldwork, extending the boundaries of society and our intellectual conversations beyond the United States. Two of those panelists are here right now sitting together in the middle. <laughs> this year, the panel will center on folklorists, leaders in the field who engage in the study of music, studying, writing about, presenting, playing and recording, broadcasting, documenting, and preserving song and music broadly defined. Through their lives of learning, we hope to learn about the fundamental genre of folklore, uh, about this particular fundamental genre of folklore, and how it's shaped the lives and careers of this diverse panel of scholars. We'll spend the next two hours or so looking at the life of learning and the choices, chances, and triumphs of participants, all of them fellows of the American Folklore Society, Erica Brady, Peggy Bulger, Alan Jabor, and Jeff Titan. As forum facilitator, I will ask each participant four questions reflecting on her or his career and how it has progressed within the discipline of folklore. We hope at the end of the session, through the exploration of individuals and their specific career trajectories, projects, and contributions, we hope to gain a broad appreciation of the important work of folklorists doing fieldwork and ethnography on the topic of music. Our aim is to reinforce the central position that the study of music has always played in the discipline of folklore and in the American Folklore Society. I'm going to very briefly introduce each of the four panelists. I'm not going to take the time to introduce them because I want to devote most of the time for us to hear their voices and not me talking about them. So I'm going to go pretty quickly in the order in which they're sitting, starting with Peggy Bulger closest to me. Peggy Bulger is Director Emerita of the American Folklife Center. She holds a PhD in Folklore and Folklife from the University of Pennsylvania. Prior to joining the American Folklife Center, she served as Florida State Arts Coordinator, Florida Folklife Programs Administrator, Program Coordinator, Director, and Senior Officer for the Southern Arts Federation. Peggy is the co-author of South Florida Folklife and the editor of Music Roots of the South. She's the producer of many videos, including Music Masters and Rhythm Kings, Every Island Has Its Own Song, Fishing All My Days. Peggy served as, for, she's a former president of the American Folklore Society as well. Erica Brady is professor in the Department of Folk Studies at Western Kentucky University. She holds a PhD in folklore from Indiana University. Erica's academic career in vernacular medicine has led her to hold faculty appointments in medicine at the University of Louisville and the University of South Alabama. 
Her publications include A Spiral Way, How the Phonograph Changed Ethnography, and Healing Logics, Culture and Medicine in Modern Health Belief Systems. Erica has produced and hosted the radio program Barren River Breakdown for 17 years, a weekly radio show on American Roots music. Jeff Todd Titan is Emeritus Professor of Music, Brown University. He has a PhD in American Studies from the University of Minnesota. Jeff is a co-founder of the American Studies program at Tufts University, and he directed the PhD program at Ethnomusicology at Brown University from 1986 to 2013. Jeff's publications include Worlds of Music, Early Down Home Blues, Powerhouse for God, and three Smithsonian Folkway recordings, A Life Story, Music and Poverty, Old Time Kentucky Fiddle Tunes, and the Handbook of Applied Ethnomusicology, a forthcoming volume. Jeff is currently running for the American Folklore Society Executive Board, so make sure to vote for him. <laughs> and while you're at it, make sure to vote for Cliff Murphy, who's sitting in the back, who's also running. <laughs> Our last panelist is Alan Jabor. Alan Jabor is the founding director of the American Folklife Center in the Library of Congress, a position he held until 1999. He was head of the Archive of Folk Song, now the Archive of Folk Culture at the Library of Congress, and the Director of Folk Arts Program at the National Endowment for the Arts. Alan holds a PhD from Duke University where he played with the Hollow Rock String Band. That's a very important fact for me. <laughs> His publications include the records American Fiddle Tunes, The Hammonds Family, a study of, the, of a West Virginia family's traditions, a Henry Reed reunion, and the wonderful book he wrote with his wife, Karen, Decoration Day in the Mountains. <laughs> Alan is also former president of the American Folklore Society. So the way we're gonna do this, we have four questions we're gonna ask them. Uh, we're gonna ask the first question, all four of them are gonna answer it, then we're gonna ask the second question, all four of them are gonna answer it. Just gonna go around in a dynamic fashion. We may have time for questions at the end, so if you do have a question, Think about it, save it towards the end, or just find them at the end um, and ask them. So the first question, we'll just begin here with Peggy as, uh, answering the first question. Again, th I have given them these questions beforehand, so they're not gonna be surprise questions. I don't think you should do that to anybody. Um, so they have had a chance to think about it. First question, what brought you to folklore? What does folklore mean to you? We'll start with Peggy, about three to five minutes or so each person. Okay. Um, well, I think my story probably parallels probably everybody up here uh, in some ways. Uh, I grew up in Albany, New York, and uh, from a very early age, I became part of a uh, group of people called the Pickin' and Singin' Gathering. And when I was 12, I got my first guitar, and uh, I had a group that I sang with. Uh, there were four girls. We were all about 13 years old, 13 to 18. Um, we played together for quite a while. We were called the Focus, F-O-L-K-U-S. We were so naive, we didn't realize you could kind of think of it in another way, four girls, you know. <laughs> anyway, we, uh, we ended up performing at Fox Hollow Folk Festival, which was a Beers family, and uh, we played at Cafe Lena up in Saratoga Springs, and uh, really got, it, uh, in fact, we were the opening act for Frank Wakefield and the Greenbrier Boys. I think that was the high point of our career. <laughs> but we really um, began to realize that there was more to uh, music than just singing, and on our own, we're starting to uh, research, you know, the songs that we were singing and actually meeting people who were traditional musicians. But uh, my high school counselor never said, you know, gee, you could go to school and become a folklorist. Yeah, that was not an option. So when I went to college, um, I went to SUNY at Albany and I was a fine arts major and I was uh, making jewelry and doing graphics and I graduated and then I had to find a job. Huh, well, um, <laughs> as I ended up, um, uh, Anyway, to make a long story short, I found out that there was this program in Cooperstown uh, that was a folk, Masters of Folk Art. I couldn't believe it. I was, so I went to talk to Bruce Buckley, and uh, of course, <laughs> I, I, I was very much of a hippie, long hair, the long skirt, and I brought my dulcimer with me. 
God. Bruce was very kind. But he did say, you know what? He said, now, if you come to Cooperstown, we don't do music. He says, we, you know, you'll learn a lot about material culture and about museums and blah, blah, blah. But my friend, Lindwin Montell, has just started this new program. It's brand new at Western Kentucky University. And I think you should go down there. So I ended up uh, you know, going down to, I guess I was in the second graduating class in 1974. Uh-huh, with my dulcimer, I did. I brought my dulcimer. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, what does folklore mean to me? Um, you know, I, and I, I've said this before, I, I don't think of folklore as being a career because I'm retired now. And, you know, a career is something where you have a chance for advancement and it is all about, you know, working um, in that traditional way. But that um, I think of it as more of a calling where you really decide on a way of life and you know that you're never going to stop being a, I mean, once you're a folklorist, you're always a folklorist. So what it means to me is really, you know, what I want to do with my life no matter where I am or, or what I'm doing. Well, I grew up in Washington, D.C., and I when, I, when I reflect on where my interests lay and where my interests lie, I think it had to do with uh, being a child who grew up in an extremely transient city. Neither of my parents were from D.C. Uh, both of my parents were extremely eager to shed their roots, uh, as, or at least selectively shed their roots, and they were... Uh, in, in the nicest sort of 1950s way, very um, aspirant. They were very, uh, they were very interested in, in moving up in the world. And uh, growing up in the suburbs, I was, I was really conscious of a kind of rootlessness that I found almost actively distressing. Uh, I used to walk our lady who came to clean for us once a week back to the bus stop so I could you know, ask her questions about her life. She was, she was an African-American lady who'd grown up in northern Virginia, had a beautiful Piedmont accent, and uh, I still have her recipe for dandelion wine, uh, <laughs> and I still try it every once in a while. Uh, the notion of having uh, things that were part of your life that had very deep roots, a, a connection with the past, was, uh, that was profoundly meaningful to me. Uh, music spoke to me, and I, I had good training formally uh, in music. I went to a school that was connected with the cathedral in Washington, and uh, I just thought everybody had to learn to sight read by the time they were in <laughs> eighth grade. But, and I loved the classical music, and I still do. It, it, uh, it meant a great deal to me and spoke to me very deeply, but I also was very attracted to these other musics in DC. I would listen to Tiger Bob Raleigh on my transistor radio under my pillar, my pillow at night, and uh, the rhythm and blues scene was very fascinating to me, and uh, the burgeoning bluegrass scene was really thrilling, and by the time I was 16, I had a like-minded boyfriend who um, was also underage, but uh, his father knew all of the managers at the clubs, so, uh, we would sneak into the Shamrock and sh sneak into uh, various uh, the showboat, which was uh, in Adams Morgan, which at that time was you know, not really a great place for us to be hanging out. But um, it was it, it was wonderful. You know, it was it was absolutely entrancing to me, uh, both African American music and uh, and white music. Um, for reasons n having nothing to do with my interest in roots music, uh, my undergraduate work was at Harvard Radcliffe, and uh, I thought, well, it'd be kind of cool if I could do something folklore-ish there. Um, and I thought in terms of music, and really pretty much had the door firmly slammed in my face once they discovered that I, I couldn't play piano. <laughs> However, it was a great time to be interested in roots music. That was where I had my first radio show. Uh, on WHRB, and uh, my show was called um, um, Blues, Blue, gosh, it's terrible. I, was, I had two shows. One was called uh, Back Porch, and, and the other was um, Bluegrass Unlimited. No, 
that's not right. <laughs> Blues Unlimited. There we go. Um, it was a long time ago. Uh, but I got to program my show sitting on the floor of the studio while a couple of guys who had a show called Hillbillies at Harvard were doing their show. And they were two guys who had a huge influence. Lee, you have, probably have some memory of those guys. And while they were playing cuts, uh, they would explain things to me. You know, okay, you know, this is Doc Watson, or um, uh, this is Hobart Smith. And it was, a, it was a wonderful education. It was also when the Rounder Collective was starting. So the Rounders were kind of like my big brothers and sister, and we're all still close. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like their little mascot. And I got involved in producing concerts at that time, along with the radio show, both um, bluegrass-related concerts and uh, blues concerts primarily, and had a chance to meet people like uh, Sun House and John Lee Hooker and folks like that. And that really locked it in. So I realized that I'm running out of time, but um, what does folklore mean to me? It's, it's, it's been a way of organizing my passions. Um, that has nothing to do with any sort of intellectual definition, although I know the intellectual definitions and, and I can apply them. It's, um, it's, it's how I see the world. And the musical point of entry was a good one because almost everything that I became passionate about in connection with music connected up with other things that made sense of the world and gave me a sense of roots. So the suburban girl from DC now has her roots in the American Folklore Society and, and this is my family and my lineage. This is so interesting to hear about these backgrounds. So different and yet so similar. Um, I wrote out some things, so I hope you won't mind if I look down at my phone occasionally here. I was uh, enmeshed in folklore from babyhood family folklore, of course, but I didn't know it. Uh, I, I grew up at first in upstate New York. I was born in 1943, and uh, my dad was in the uh, First World War. He was, uh, Second World War, he was overseas. Uh, am I not coming through clearly enough? Yeah. A little closer, okay. <clears throat> um, my mother, who tells me uh, that I mumbled, or told me that I mumbled, <laughs> also uh, told me that I sang before I, mm -hmm. before I spoke. My first words were, Pepecota hit a pot, Pepecota hit a pot, which is the Pepsi-Cola commercial. <laughs> Pepsi-Cola hits the spot. Uh, <laughs> and uh, another formidable musical experience I had came from my grandfather, his, uh, my father's father, who had two wonderful professions. He was a wine taster, uh, that was his vocation, and his avocation was an opera singer. He sang at the Metropolitan Opera in, in New York, and uh, he sang whenever we visited him. And you can imagine uh, what it would be like for a four- or five-year-old boy to suddenly hear your grandfather at the top of his lungs singing a, 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 te a tenor, an aria, from an opera. I was quite terrified, and, and although I... <laughs> I do love certain kinds of classical music. I've never liked opera. Uh, Thoreau said that opera was for, for deaf people. Uh, uh, I didn't think as I was growing up of the children's games that I played. We moved, by the way, to Manhattan in New York, uh, uh, where my father had a job when he came back from uh, service. And uh, I didn't think of those children's games like King and shooting bottle caps as folklore, although clearly they, they were. I went to a Pete Seeger concert at Town Hall when I was about 12 years old, and I enjoyed that, but I didn't think of it as folk music or anything. If anything, it was like camp songs to me, is what I thought. <laughs> I suppose I began to think about folklore, and particularly folk music, as a separate category in high school. And what brought or attracted, to, uh, attracted me to it was similar to what attracted Erica <coughs> and Peggy which was that I thought it was a more meaningful kind of music than all the other musics that were around, mostly rock and roll, but, but others. My dad was a, an amateur jazz guitarist, and so mm -hmm. I learned to uh, play the guitar by sneaking it out from under where he had it in the closet or under the bed when they would go out of an evening. Um, and uh, I was also attracted 
uh, to folk music studies at that time. Some one of my teachers, I think, told me that there were ballads and ballad studies, and so I started reading about Sir Patrick Spens and that sort of thing. That kind of interested me, but it was my reading. What brought me to folklore studies, I think, more than anything else, was my reading in my senior year of high school of James Agee and Walker Evans' book, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. That set me on a path toward a kind of folklore studies that arose from immersive long-term field work, born out of reciprocities and friendships, uh, born out of ethnographic documentation, and from interpretation of that documentation, its meanings and significance. And uh, I, I also never thought of folklore as a career. In fact, I never thought I had a career until somebody <laughs> told me that I had one. Uh, I think this was after I got tenure. <laughs> and, uh, in fact, I, I went into university life because I didn't want a career. To me, somebody who, who uh, um, worked for IBM or Xerox had a career, you know, and I didn't want that. So. Um, what folklore to me is, is this. Uh, folklore is the creative performance of the commonwealth of traditional culture. And its expression affirms life. Increasingly, I view it as an alternative to the official culture, which is death, whether expressed in the evolutionary biology of the selfish gene or in the cost-benefit analysis of neoclassical economics and global corporate capitalism, which is not corporate at all, it's individualistic, and which is all destroying, Earth, uh, destroying life on planet Earth. And I think that we as folklorists uh, can uh, enlist on the side of, uh, of life <laughs> and not death. They may be using this mic for the recording, I don't know. You can use whichever, if you prefer oh, that one, that's fine. It doesn't matter, this is fine. Well, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, which is a deep south, it certainly at that time would have been described as a deep south, grimy port town. And uh, uh, I, I liked it pretty well. I, I like port towns, Grammy or not. And uh, I was a member of a very small subgroup, but didn't know it. But gradually I came to realize that there, though there weren't many Syrian crackers in the world, I was one of them. Uh, my mother was from rural North Florida and grew, grew up in that region uh, South Georgia and North Florida, where people self-describe themselves as crackers. There's a larger region where people describe other people as crackers, but uh, we're not speaking of that. Only in a place like North Florida in the country would you grow up thinking of yourself as a cracker. Well, my mother moved to town, Jacksonville, but uh, she still felt that she was a cracker. And if these things are inherited, then I suppose I'm a cracker too. And, but my father was from Syria, upcountry Syria, north of Damascus, about 40 miles, and, and uh, migrated to this country, joining his father who had migrated here and right after World War I, and uh, ended up owning a grocery store in Jacksonville. So I grew up in the grocery business. Uh, my dad was a grocer, but also I worked in the store. I did everything except cut meat. He didn't allow me to cut meat because he feared, he knew how many butchers he knew who were missing a finger and uh, scary stuff to work with day in and day out. Uh, and, which brings me to the next part of my self-portrait, I was already a musician because I was playing violin since I was about seven. There was a little elementary school orchestra uh, in our school, Fishware School, and uh, uh, that uh, they brought me down there uh, uh, in, I was seven years old, but I was in third grade. I was a year ahead of myself. and uh, They brought me into this room and 
there was a bunch of kids scratching away on stringed instruments. And, uh, and they said, would you like to play one of these instruments? And I said, sure. And they said, which one? And I didn't know I was going to grow up to be six foot five inches, you know. And so I said, violin, I guess. And, uh, and I took the violin and started playing it and, and pretty soon was taking lessons and was in the Jacksonville Junior Symphony, I think it was called, later renamed Youth Orchestra. Uh, and uh, by the time I was in 11th grade, I was playing in the Jacksonville Symphony, the grown-up symphony. And in fact, by 12th grade, uh, I was principal of the second violins in, uh, in the symphony, which was an awesome task to do because you're then in charge of a section of musicians, getting them all to play the right bowings and everything, uh, including school teachers who were 60 years old and, <laughs> and you're, you're telling them, here's the bowing you should use. And, uh, that together with working in my father's store, I think both introduced me at an early stage in life to hanging out a lot with older people. And uh, I think in some way that may figure in my bio. Uh, I, I was used to hanging out with older people on a sort of a role of equality, a comfortable role, and, and learning about them and getting them to learn about me. Uh, my music continued through uh, the University of Miami they gave me a scholarship to go down there and I played in the orchestra and played in the University of Miami String Quartet. I was already long enough into music that I thought I didn't want to do this for a career. Uh, something more practical. English literature, <laughs> so, you know. And, so, uh, and uh, uh, I majored in English and gravitated toward medieval literature and linguistics as an undergraduate, uh, but continued playing music all the way through my undergraduate years. Uh, and uh, by the time I went to graduate school uh, at Duke in 1963, I was quitting music. The violin went under the bed and pretty well stayed there. And I was busy working on other things, but uh, somehow or another, I have to tell you that though music was important to me, including classical music and including modern music, I also felt that modern art, modern music and modern art were headed toward a sort of a, a cul-de-sac or a dead end. It felt like this, even if it glistened, wasn't a course that led, led us where we all want to go. And somehow, I think it was that underlying feeling about modernity, a little bit of an anti-modern feeling, and maybe I heard notes of that in the others of us as we all <laughs> talked, uh, that drew me into folklore more deeply. Uh, what do I, I love the word calling, by the way. I think, I think that just perfectly expresses my feeling. You know, folklorist is an identity word for me now, and people ask me a sort of a what are you question, you know, <laughs> and, and my answer is folklorist. Mm -hmm. uh, what does folklore mean to me? I, I don't have a specific answer for that. I would say that I see folklore both as a very personal expression at the grassroots of, by individuals, uh, the hearth side of folklore, you might say, and as a broader uh, way of uh, interconnection of all of us to each other. And there I think of folklore not at the hearth, but at the marketplace. And I think both aspects of folklore uh, are, are important to reflect on, or certainly are important to me. You know, I've felt it important to document personally 
I still do field documentation, but I also feel it's important to look at the big picture of folklore in the world uh, and what it means connecting people up on a worldwide basis. Thank you, that's been lovely so far. If we just stopped right now, this would have been a wonderful opportunity to get to know things about all the panelists that we, we have never known before. So great, we're gonna continue. I think what we're gonna do, and I'm gonna pose the second question, and we'll start with Alan and move the microphone back. Um, oh. Just to keep it. I was gonna try out this one for a second. You can try that. Yeah. You can do anything you want. So we're just gonna keep okay. it kind of wild and crazy and dynamic, and we'll never know who the next person is <laughs> until it happens. So the second question is, what were some great influences and inspirations for you that have led you on your career. These could be teachers or scholarly works or informants. So we'll start with Alan and work our, work our way back here. Okay, I'll, I'll start with an, an interesting gambit here. Bela Bartok. He had a huge influence of me as an, on me as an undergraduate. I remember finding the, the six Bartok quartets and listening to them and going, Karen remembers this about me, and going every day and listening to more to the Bartok Quartets at the University of Miami Music Library. And I studied the scores and I just, I just immersed myself in that. That was my immersion in modernity. But I then discovered that Bartok was a, was something of a folklorist himself. He was, in fact, you know, an early ethnomusicologist. Uh, and I read uh, the first year in 1963, his book, uh, Hungarian Folk Music, which has an introduction in it. Came out 1906 or 1908, I forget. 1910, sorry. I'm, I think I'm barely in the right decade there. Uh, uh, but uh, he talked about style and, and one of the things I took away from Bartok that was kind of life-changing for me is though I was by then in graduate school getting interested in, in the history of ballads as individual artifacts you know, or fiddle tunes later as artifacts that's the large history that I'm interested in. Uh, Bartok awakened me to the thought that style in folk music told you dimensions of what you're listening to, that the, the individual artifact as a song or as a tune, in effect as a text, could never teach you. The same song could be sung in many different styles, and the style could be the guide to the dimension of culture that you were listening to that this person was carrying on in their tradition. And, and uh, so Bartok helped me sort of rethink my mission as not just connecting up artifacts historically, but uh, understanding style as a representation of deeper things spiritually in, in human beings. So Bartok has always been a hero of mine. Folklorist, modern composer, uh, a composer who was inspired by folk music, but who didn't quote folk music, but rather was in, let it infuse him in a deeper way and, uh, and uh, inspired his expression of modernity. Uh, I'll name a second inspiration. Holger Nygaard, my ballad professor in 1963 uh, in, uh, at Duke University, uh, whose ballad seminar, uh, which included, by the way, dragging out Library of Congress uh, documentary recordings and playing them for me. So, I didn't realize that my life was being adumbrated for me, you know, as I listened eagerly to these Library of Congress recordings. Uh, but uh, Holger was a, a, a wonderful, a tough, disciplined, uh, intellectual, 
but also a, a supportive uh, guide for me in my master's thesis and in my PhD dissertation. And uh, so, and he's one of many folklorists of that generation, some of who are still alive, who now don't come to meetings and the younger generation don't know about them or anything about who they were and what they contributed, but they're part of our history and they certainly were part of mine. So I mentioned Holger partly to evoke those generations that are all too easily forgotten. A third, and here I turn to me as the administrator, Harold Spivak, chief of the music division at the Library of Congress. He was chief of the music division uh, over Alan Lomax. He was Alan Lomax's boss, and he was my boss. He hired me. Uh, uh, of course, Ray Corson, who was the retiring head of the archive, may have put him up to it, but he was the guy that hired me. He came out to UCLA and interviewed me. Uh, I didn't know I was being interviewed. He said he wanted to meet the editor of their new album, American Fiddle Tunes, because I had agreed to do that. And so we sat and talked and talked and talked. And I thought, gosh, an hour and a half has already gone by, you know. And, and, and then suddenly he says, well, you may not know this, but uh, Ray Corson is retiring. Would you be interested in being the next head of the Archive of Folk Song? And I tell you, I may have muttered something that sounded like I'll think about it, but in my heart, I had just a year ago arrived, or less than a year ago arrived at UCLA and thought I was settling down to a nice life in the academy. And my, but my heart leapt up and I was ready to go. I had already gone to the library as a researcher, so they knew me there and maybe that helped too, you know. If, they, if you go to the library of your own volition, you must believe in this institution. And, and so they believed in me. But Harold was a wonderful guide. He, he guided by storytelling, and I don't dare tell all the stories that he told for this recording, but uh, he, uh, he had stories about everybody that he encountered, which was pretty well everybody in our field, because as chief of the music division, he was over the archive of what was originally the archive of American folk song, and, uh, and then the archive of folk song, now the archive of folk culture. But uh, he knew these people personally, and he told, he taught, he guided indirectly through anecdote. That was his, he would go for lunch every day in the recording lab, and I would go back there and grab a sandwich and eat a sandwich with him and the recording engineers and whoever else was back there, and he would just talk, you know, and that talk was some of the great guidance and instruction of my life. And one more administrator, Nancy Hanks, mm -hmm. who was chairman of the chairman was the title, and so she said, no, no, chairman, you know. Uh, so Nancy was chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, and she hired me to be the first director of folk arts and, and to start the folk arts program. She too was an inspiration, and she too modeled and, and did it all by indirection. She didn't boss people around or give orders or stuff. But somehow she inspired us all, and that era in the National Endowment for the Arts was truly an inspiring era for everybody who worked there. We all felt like we were missionaries for a, an even higher calling. I was a missionary for folk arts, but one of many missionaries for the arts writ large, and, uh, and Nancy, she, she conveyed that in her spirit, in her style, and it was an awesome experience to work under her, so. Well, uh, I wrote down a, 
whole list of people, acknowledgments, I guess, thank you. I felt like I was uh, <laughs> writing an acknowledgment section here. Uh, I should say that uh, I left Manhattan when I was 15 years old and my family moved to Atlanta, Georgia, and I finished up high school there and um, began playing the guitar in public and also that's where I first became interested in blues music. Uh, I would go underage, I guess, sort of the way Erica would do to clubs. I saw B.B. King at the 617 Club when I was 16 years old, and that was interesting because later when I began to think about blues uh, music and how tourism had become so important in, in blues, I thought of myself as a tourist probably at age 16, but nobody else there was tourists. This was just an unmade, unmediated experience for them, and that, that was kind of interesting to think about all that. And I became attracted to blues music in high school and had a chance to see people like B.B. Uh, King and some of the uh, people who were rediscovered in the blues revival. I saw them in college, people like uh, Sunhouse and uh, Skip James and Mississippi John Hurt. I tried to learn to play the guitar like Mississippi John Hurt, and uh, Still trying. <laughs> uh, um, blues singer uh, Lazy Bill Lucas was probably the most influential blues singer for me because I had the chance to play in his blues band when I was a graduate school. In graduate school, and this was before I, I learned anything about ethnomusicology. I, when I learned about field work in my ethnomusicology and anthropology classes, I wondered whether that was what I was doing. I could see that. I could have could be doing it, but I had started out just trying to learn music from this person and hang out with him and his buddies and so on and so forth. So uh, it, it caused me to think about the nature of, of, of field work, and I'm still thinking about that too. Other uh, people who were very important to me, my field partners over the years, uh, people like uh, Reverend C.L. Franklin, Aretha Franklin's father, whom I spent a year with in Detroit on a, a fellowship, and here I need to thank Alan, who I think was part of the group that gave me $1,500 so that I could get a, <laughs> I, could, I went out and I got a, a video porta pack and made videotapes of Reverend Franklin's sermons. He was the, he was acknowledged as the, as the finest black Baptist preacher of his, of his generation. And, and it turns out these are the only full length documents of Reverend Franklin's preaching. And there was a conference just, just last year celebrating his legacy, 500 black scholars and ministers were there, and me, and <laughs> I showed one of the videos, and, and uh, uh, they loved it, but they, they were just very so puzzled. Why, why was I there? <laughs> <You know? laughs> I, I couldn't quite explain it to them. I'm not sure I can explain it to you either, but something about the sound of his preaching attracted me com combined with his or oratory. And of course, he became one of a series of wise elders uh, Alan uh, can talk about Henry Reed, I'm sure, as someone. He will, okay. So. <laughs> uh, and uh, Elwood Cornett, the old regular Baptist leader who uh, uh, since uh, 1990 has been an extraordinarily uh, influential person on me, perhaps the wisest elder I've ever, ever known. Uh, wonderful, wonderful person. I've known him now for 25 years. In fact, he and his sister and his wife just visited me in Maine last, uh, last summer. Um, I'd like to mention in high school, Clyde Taylor, who, who taught me how to understand poetry. In college, Bill Coles, who encouraged me to learn, to think, feel, and write my way towards clarity. And Henry Mishkin, who taught me how to think more formally about music. In college, I also had the good fortune to learn from two ecological scientists, Oscar Chate, who was teaching at Amherst College in his 80s. Uh, too old to retire, I guess, or too eminent. Chate had studied with Ernst Haeckel, mm. and it was Haeckel who had coined the term ecology uh, back, I think, in the 1860s. <laughs> so uh, I learned, I learned uh, uh, from uh, Oscar Chate, and then a, another person, Lawrence Hinkle, uh, who was working on a human ecology project. I, I, uh, I worked with him on that. And he taught me uh, about uh, ecology and, and broadened my understanding from, from ecology of, uh, of nature to culture. 
Uh, Chate was particularly interested in sustainability, by the way. Another major influence was Leo Marx, my college honors thesis advisor, whose early work in eco-criticism made it easier for me to find my way decades later in eco-musicology. Among my graduate school teachers, I would mention Alan Kagan, who taught me ethnomusicology, and the political scientist Mulford Sibley, whose work in the history of nonviolent resistance showed me how to merge the personal and the political. Among my student colleagues, and this was at the University of Minnesota, I would single out Lewis Hyde, whom I first met when we performed at an anti-Vietnam War concert in the fall of 1966. You may know of Hyde as the author of the book The Gift and Trickster uh, uh, and so on. He, he's a wonderful, wonderful person, still friends. It would take too much time to mention all the colleagues I've been inf influenced by, but let me note a few of those who not only were influences, but who became my good friends in the first decade of my teaching. The poet, Kenneth Irby. The anthropologist, Dennis Tedlock. Ethnomusicologists, Dave McAllister and Willard Rhodes. And folklorists, David Evans, Sandy Ives, and Albert Lord. Thank you, Jeff. Um, <laughs> what he said, yeah. What he said. Uh, actually, uh, this will come circling around again, but I should say that, that uh, two people who've been very important in my development as a folklorist uh, are up here on the podium, uh, Alan Jabour and Jeff Titan. Um, Peggy, you've been a wonderful and warm friend, but we've never worked together in quite the same way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my first real teacher uh, as a folklorist where I really began to learn methodology was my grandfather, uh, who was perhaps the loneliest man I've ever known. And uh, we would come to visit once a year. He lived in a small coal town in Pennsylvania called Forty Fort. And he had had an extraordinarily interesting life, which nobody, no one but me, had any interest in it. So from the time I was about seven years old, uh, we would go uh, to Forty Fort and he and I would sit on the front porch of the house in a, a swing and he would tell me stories about his childhood uh, in St. Croix on a sugar plantation there. And uh, he could only remember one song from that, but that's like my little treasure, my little musical legacy. And my brothers would, would take bets on how long I could sit there drinking iced tea and not have to go to the bathroom because I, I didn't want to break the, the, the rhythm. Um, the year my grandfather died, I started at Harvard Radcliffe and while I said that they slammed the door on me as far as music went, um, wonderful doors opened to me when I turned to medieval literature. So like Alan, you know, I share that. And uh, some of the most inspiring teachers I had uh, right along the, through my graduate work were uh, medievalists who were sympathetic to my perspective. Um, Jerry Whiting was a remarkable uh, teacher. He was a Chaucerian. His teacher had been Kittredge, and you know, we, so there's lineage for you. Um, William, William Alfred uh, taught me to read poetry. And my, uh, my honors thesis was uh, based on work that I was doing with Albert Lord, who was one of the great teachers I've, I've ever known. Um, I, he, I had two independent studies consecutively with him, and he was the um, supervisor for my honors thesis. And he, was, he, was a, he, he remains a kind of uh, exemplar uh, for me of humility and uh, scholarship. Uh, he, was a, he was a truly wonderful man. Yeah. Um, I've written down something here that I can't even read. Imagine. That, that must mean I'm senior. Um, in graduate school, I was uh, fortunate. No, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm skipping ahead um, because this is where Alan comes in, and I'll come back to this. Uh, I worked at the Library of Congress. Um, Alan uh, took me under his wing, and that was huge because through those doors came everybody. 
And that was a, a, a remarkable time. It was before the establishment of the Folk Life Center. Um, I was in the um, recorded sound division, so I worked with wonderful engineers there like Bob Carneal and John Howell, it was wonderful. Um, in graduate school, I was assigned to uh, D.K. Wilkes as a graduate assistant. And I think what I really took from him was not only the legitimacy of country music as an appropriate area of study for a folklorist, but his absolute passion for the stuff. He just loved the music. You know, he would listen and cry and, and was just passionately engaged with it. And uh, he had kind of made a little shift to Irish music then, and that was primarily what I worked with. Uh, but it was at that time that I met, uh, well, I had met Archie Green before when I was at the library uh, and Bess Hawes. Um, my, my, the, 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 my troika of uh, people I feel accountable to as a folklorist include uh, Archie and Bess and Barry Tolkien, and I, I often find myself thinking, what would Archie do, what would Bess do, what would Barry do, and I often don't do that, but at, <laughs> you know, at least I have a kind of benchmark of accountability, not only to the field, but to beyond that, to the, the kind of uh, ethics of consequence. Um, I was enormously blessed when I moved to Western Kentucky, I knew that from the start. But one of the first people I met with, who made a tremendous impact on me and who remains a very, very dear friend is the thumb picker, Eddie Pennington, uh, who is someone whose devotion to craft is phenomenal. And hearing him for the first time was a revelation. And becoming part of a, a, a kind of ongoing connection with a musical community for the first time in my life and a truly remarkable music community with profound roots in the Western Coal Escarpment in Western Kentucky um, has been uh, transformative for me. I knew from the first time I heard Eddie play that my life and the direction of my work would change radically, it was transformative, but it has continued to be uh, a tremendous uh, element uh, in my life. Um, in, in 2009, I uh, had a number of things in my personal life that were very difficult. Uh, both my mother and my husband were, uh, were very ill simultaneously, and I was the primary caregiver for both of them. And it was, uh, it was really, pretty hellish. And I had been working off and on as a presenter um, for a gospel musician, a black gospel musician named John Edmonds. And um, I had set up a gig for John and was driving him home uh, back to his house from that. And it was one of those moments, in a way, um, one of those chance events that we're going to be talking about later. Um, I thought, you know, what would be cool would be for me to sing black gospel. <laughs> and, you know, I wasn't thinking at all about, sing, about playing out. I, you know, I've been a performer off and on all my adult life in bluegrass and old time music, and, and that was great, and I still love it. But I thought, I, I just had this sense that there'd be some healing there that I really wanted to connect with. And I asked him, uh, you know, I said, JB, do you ever take vocal students, and he said, well, of course. Uh, he's, he's a vocalist and a pianist. And I said, well, would you, know, would, you, would you think about taking this honky chick under your wing? And he said, oh, yeah, I'd love to do that. So I started getting together with him once a week. Uh, we became very, very, very close friends. And uh, after I'd been working with him about nine months, he said, so, when are, when are we gonna do our first concert? And that, you know, that raised all of these issues about, you know, I'd gone to, I'd gone to in Indiana with an unsigned contract for my first record album and then met Richard Dorson. So, yeah, <laughs> that, that ended that career right there. And I'd always had this sort of self-consciousness about performance, which John just totally blew away 
And so uh, six weeks or two months later, uh, John and I had our premiere concert and I still sing a lot with him um, in churches and at blues festivals and um, barbecues and funerals and weddings. And, uh, you know, I think I had to come right around to feel okay about obviously being not a member of the community. I'm called in to, to fill um, slots in choirs when they need somebody. And not only am I the only white person there, I sing tenor. <laughs> so you know, it, it's been tremendously, um, it's been a tremendous opportunity. And I really related to uh, what Jeff was saying about the C.L. Franklin work. And Jeff has been kind of a touchstone for me, uh, even in ways that he can't imagine, for uh, permitting yourself to connect with community in ways that in some ways our training uh, made us self-conscious about. Can you use this? Yeah, yeah I, th I think this might work a little better. Yeah, um, well first of all, before I go into my influences, I, it's just so amazing whenever I'm hearing what you all are saying and things resonate with me, but <laughs> the one thing when Jeff was talking about the first thing your parents remember you saying was this Pepsi ad. Well, in my family, there is a story when I was three years old, I was in my high chair, and they came in and I'm sitting in my high chair going, my beer is Rheingold, the bry beer. Make it Rheingold whenever you buy beer. It's not bitter, not sweet, it's that extra strong sweet. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so there might, there, I think that's a mean, the, that's like a, a topic, you know, one of those things that go through. Anyway, there's, you know, all of us, I think, could really go into all of the people. <laughs> I was Irish, maybe I already knew, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, all the people who've had an influence uh, uh, on your life, but it, particularly on why you went into folklore and what, what makes you a folklorist. And I guess the first real big influence in my life was Pete Seeger. I met him when I was 13. Um, I was from Albany, he's from Beacon. Um, he introduced me to Libba Cotton, um, and I sailed on the clear water uh, a couple of times. And, uh, you know, he was just larger than life. He always was, and he, you know, miss him still. Uh, so that was one of the, the big influences, continues to be an influence. But as I said, I was really an art major. I was into fine art, and I had never lived anywhere but Albany, New York. And uh, I got a scholarship to go to Penland School of Crafts in uh, North Carolina, Spruce Pine. And I was, uh, I guess I was a freshman in college. So I was about 18 or 19. And um, uh, I was studying jewelry design. But the, um, the glass making uh, uh, professor or, or teacher there that summer was Dale Chihuly. Oh. And he, it was before he had his eye patch too. It would have been 1968, maybe. Anyway, he had a big influence on everybody. I mean, he was, a, again, another larger-than-life person. But he, um, he had a way of, of imparting the importance of, of craft and the importance of really putting your all into whatever you're doing, whether it's making a pie or making a beautiful chandelier. Um, although I'm glad I never did glass blowing, you're either getting cut or burned or, you know, <laughs> those people, they look like they had been through the war after, after that summer. But he had a big influence on me and I, I ended up um, going outside of the School of Crafts and traveling around the mountains a little bit and finding uh, traditional quilt makers and they had a huge influence on me also. But when I went to uh, Western Kentucky, there were only three people on the faculty. It was a very small program. Uh, the young Turk was uh, Linwood Montell. He was straight out of graduate school and first job. But the senior folklorists there on the faculty were Ken and Mary Clark. And uh, many of you may know, Ken was a student of Stith Thompson and uh, very much uh, a narrative scholar and 
um, just a wonderful guy. And his wife, Mary, had studied with uh, Mac Edward Leach, and she came out of Penn. So we had the IU and the Penn, and they were a married couple. And, and Mary was the ballad scholar. And um, we still had like a little, <laughs> we had one of those little, uh, record players, you know, that looks like a suitcase, and you know, you have the, and um, the one thing about Mary, she never could get that, that arm right there on the needle, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so we finally, we finally had somebody in the class be her assistant to put that needle down so that we could <laughs> actually hear what we were supposed to hear, which brings me to um, when, so I was at, uh, Western in 1972 and three. And um, in my class, uh, there was a, a, um, a fellow student, his name is George Reynolds, and many of you may know him, wonderful uh, guy from Hillsville, Virginia. Um, and he was a musician, and uh, he ended up, after graduating, going on to uh, uh, Work, start the music program at Foxfire. He went to Highlander Center. Uh, he's still teaching music. We're still friends. But he kind of took me under his wing because he realized I was from upstate New York. You know, people would ask me to say coffee, and oh my God, you know. And uh, I, he just said, he called me PG. He said, PG, I think I better take you under my wing because you're never going to make it here in the South if you don't have somebody. But he, he was like a. Um, Gosh, George, he, he had a huge influence on me because he was a, a fellow student. He was very smart, but he also, he was just so generous uh, with his time and, and with everything. When, when I went uh, to Florida, right after I graduated, I, I actually got a job at Berea for a little bit, and then I went to Florida. And um, the reason why I ended up in Florida is because of Archie Green. Uh, he, was, uh, he was advising Al Head, who was at the um, Stephen Foster Center, and I think Alan also was advising him, and Bess Hawes to a little extent, but mainly Archie. Um, Archie had known I was really looking for a job, and so Al had to find somebody to come down to Florida right away because he had an NEA grant to do a year-long survey and he needed to hire somebody. Well, this is back in the days when you didn't have computers or anything and I was sending out resumes and snail mail, hundreds of them, you know, trying to find a job and getting rejection after rejection and I got, uh, I got a call from Al. And Al had, um, as many of you know, if you, uh, he was on a session earlier in the, um, in the conference here, and he is a National Heritage Award winner. He's won the best Lomax Hawes Award, but he started the F Florida Folklife Program, the Louisiana Folklife Program, and the Center for uh, Traditional Culture in Alabama, and he uh, continues to, I think, inform my work anyway uh, in what he does. Every time I hear him talk about what he, how he interacts with folklorists and why he feels folklore is so important to all of the arts and all of the humanities, he makes a lot, a lot of sense. Um, after I'd been in Florida for 10 years, I went away to get my PhD at Penn. And the two, the two teachers who uh, were amazing, Henry, Henry Glassy, whose art form is teaching, I swear to God, he is you know, if you've never taken a class with Henry Glassie, you're missing um, an artist, you know. He's wonderful. And then, of course, Kenny Goldstein. And what can you say about Kenny except he's a force of nature, <laughs> and he, uh, he will make it happen. And if, if it wasn't for Kenny, I wouldn't have been able to go to Penn and get my degree. He made it possible for me to get a leave of absence from my Florida job and go up and do all the coursework in one year. <sighs> yeah, I about killed me, but I did it. <laughs> um, and then finally, um, back to Florida. When I, when I went to Florida, of course, I met Stetson Kennedy right off the bat. And uh, Stetson is, um, if you don't, I, I can't, you know, it would take way too long to tell you all about Stetson, but in a nutshell, Stetson was the head of the Florida 
um, the folklore unit for the Florida Writers Project uh, during the WPA. And when I came down to Florida in 1976, I kept running across all these materials he, that he and Zora Neale Hurston and Herbert Halpert and um, uh, Alan Lomax had collected. And I just assumed he was dead because he, you know, he was working in the 1930s. And f come to find out, he was younger than I am today when I met him. He was like 60 or something. And I, I went over to Jacksonville and started working with Stetson and worked with him for probably 20 years. And he ended up being my dissertation topic. And, um, and finally, uh, Lucretti Clark was one of the first people that I ended up doing significant field work with. She, she was a... Uh, white oak basket maker, but she was really a Renaissance woman. She, she was the daughter of slaves. She lived outside of Tallahassee, still on an old plantation, um, in, in a house, a, a little house where she taught me everything from how to cook collard greens to how to chop down an oak tree so that you can make the white oak baskets to uh, about how she saw when she was a young girl, she saw a comical star. It was Halley's Comet that she saw. And so she was, she was just a poet. Anyway, yeah. so those are, um, those are some of my influences. <laughs> Thank you, that was beautiful. I love how teachers and colleagues, but also artists and musicians are part of the people that affected you and influenced you. Now, I know that the, um, the Candidates Forum is in this room, so we're going to have to end this at 4. It's quarter, it's 3.15 right now. So we have two more questions. I don't know if we can get through two questions back and forth. So I can, we could either ask, since you have the questions before you, we can ask you oh, which of the two would you rather this. answer. And we don't have to necessarily all answer the same question. Does that sound like? Mm -hmm. And then if we have time, we'll go back and answer the other one. Does that sound good? Sounds good. So the, se the third question that we had were, what are key organizing concepts that you have found consistently interesting in your progress and your career? And the fourth question was, where, were there chance encounters and ac were there chance events and accidental encounters? So um, the third question, were there key organizing concepts that you have found consistently, consistently interesting in your progress and your career? Does anybody want to answer that as your question? Jeff. I found this. Oh, wait, wait. <laughs> yeah, please make sure you talk to the mic. We're recording this session. Is this okay to use this one? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think maybe it's a little clearer. Uh, I found this a very difficult, very difficult question, and that's why I want to try to speak to it. And I, I want to speak at a very elementary level here. Uh, we're all identified because of our interest in, in music, and in the last. I guess eight or nine years I've realized that what I've been interested in all along is sound. And mm. music is a kind of sound, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested in sound. What attracted me to, to um, the preaching of Reverend C.L. Franklin, for example, was the sound of his hooping. Uh, what attracts me to musical preaching of old regular Baptists is the sound of that musical preaching and the way that they talk about how sound has a drawing power and keeps them in a particular place, um, how it is formative in their experiences when they hear it echoing up and down the, the hills, how sound sacralizes uh, place and space. So I, I think uh, I want to uh, just change the terminology a little bit and, and talk about sound. Thoreau said that music was just a reflection of, of sounds of the universe anyway. Human music was just a small small part of it. Um, so for me, the three key concepts are sound, presence, and sustainability. Sound, I think, is basic to communication insofar as living creatures make sound vibrations and respond to sound in order to construct and function within their environments. This has led me to explore the relations between sound and place particularly how sound articulates life in place, whether through animal sound signals, human music, or narratives of place. Presence is awareness of oneself 
and also awareness of other living beings. It leads to co-presence when two or more beings sense the presence of one another. And presence is the basis of reciprocity. And it led me to practice and then over the years to advocate for a kind of field work based on reciprocal bonds of friendship rather than on treating one's field partners as if they were objects for scientific investigation. Presence is also the awareness of experience in that experience is phenomenologically present to consciousness. And it's a full body consciousness, not just a mental consciousness. Regarding sustainability, my third organizing concept, I've been theorizing ecological approaches to musical and cultural sustainability based on principles of diversity, interconnection, limits to growth, and most importantly, stewardship, considering resilience as a goal of adaptive cultural management and all working towards cultural equity and social, economic, and environmental justice. Thank you, that was very nice. Do, do the other three, Erica, do you want to tackle this one? I, I'd like to follow this uh, because what I had jotted down is a really interesting counterpoint to Jeff's remarks. Um, and the first thing I thought was oh, I'm supposed to say something like tradition, but you know we can take that for granted. Um, a couple of things, I, I'm copying a quote from my dear friend Jim Griffith, and he may actually have copped this from somewhere else, but uh, the notion of a passionate particularism, you know, that, that, that there is a, a, a oneness of moment and individual that it's been given to us as our gift to respond to, and for me, the, the key word in the response and a kind of abiding interest at all levels in my work, even when I was a medievalist, um, and certainly as a musician, is silence. Uh, mm -hmm. So sound and silence we have, uh, we have paired here because I, what I learned from my grandfather was what not to say. No, to, 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 to be responsive but to give him the space to articulate what he needed to about his past. And uh, the, 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 the craft of listening, I think, is very special for us as folklorists, um, as well as musicians, the space between the notes, uh, that silence that you leave, the silence of an audience when you've really nailed it. Mm. is very, very powerful. And I, I, I also kind of characterize a triad in all of this, and I, I hope it doesn't sound too much like uh, what my friend Scott Stroot says, woo-woo stuff. <laughs> but uh, I think there is a kind of interpenetration of empathy, spirituality, and creativity that we are really beautifully positioned to be receptive to when we learn to, to listen and to befriend. Um, I'm a new gardener. I, I've had a vegetable garden for the first time in the, in the last three years, and um, the fellow who's helped me design it is a permacultural person. Um, so it, it's all about sustainability, and what I've learned is that how you do that is you observe and listen. You know, you don't just grab off the vegetables, you see what's happening, and you see what happens to them when they die, you know, and you listen to them as they, uh, as they go through their full cycle, and then they don't, they're not weeds, they're biomass. <laughs> and, you know, I think there's a lot, I, 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 I've done so much in the last few years of connecting up that practice, and it's a practice really in the spiritual sense, not just something I do, with my music and with my teaching and with my life as a folklorist. Hmm. Okay. Do the two of you want to answer this question, Alan and Peggy? Um, um, for the okay. okay. Peggy? I, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a try. I, I must admit I was a little intimidated by the question, but um, there are certain things that keep, I guess, coming up as concepts that uh, won't let go. And as a folklorist, you know, every folklorist I've talked to, it's just the, the necessity to keep defining and redefining tradition, folklore, and authenticity. I mean, um, 
how you defined it two years ago may not be the way that you would define it today, but also being able to articulate, and, and I find this so, you know, I've always been in public folklore, so I've always been having to talk to the public about, you know, what does a folklorist do? Do you tell stories? Do you know? And, and having to um, explain how much a part of their own lives folklore is, um, it, it's one of those things that keeps cropping up. Uh, the other is the push and pull of history and, um, you know, the, uh, the inevitable changes that are coming. And how do we as folklorists, um, I guess, build upon the knowledge that we have of uh, tradition and history to uh, create a world that is a better place. And finally, um, I'm really interested in this right now since I've retired. Um, I'm back in Florida, and when people retire to Florida, <laughs> they retire with their tribe. I mean, the, you know, Belleville is all Polish, and you know, Tarpon Springs is Greek, and there's 20,000 Finns in Lake Worth, and there's Lebanese in Jacksonville, and, um, and there are whole neighborhoods like in uh, this incredible retirement thing called the villages there's a whole neighborhood called Dayton because everybody from Dayton Ohio came down and retired together so um, uh, my children had told me mom you know you have a tribe and it's true I realized you know we pick and choose the people that we want to associate with for our entire lives most of us who are folklorists have a lot of folklorists who we have known now for 45 years and will continue to know so I'm real interested now in I guess the folklore of retirees <laughs> good topic um, it is 3.30 I think we could probably do it so Alan do you want to answer this question and then we have then we'll do about yeah I think that, that will complete this and then okay. I think all of us can keep our fourth question answers a tiny bit shorter and we can get done we'll have well, enough time well I'll, I'll I'll keep my response quick and I already touched on it because style really is my touchstone in life and and I brought this up vis-a-vis -vis Bartok but uh, uh, it really has governed uh, all of my interests, you know, style. We're now, my wife and I, Karen and I, are now working on rural southern cemeteries. And if people ask, well, what are you doing? Or, are you interested in the transcriptions or, or what? Well, I'm interested in cemetery style, you know, and that's a broad concept, but it's not everything, you know. It's, there's a whole lot of things about cemeteries I'm only vaguely interested in, but style I'm deeply interested in. And in music, style led me to into a discipline of transcription, transcribing Henry Reed's fiddle tunes and uh, trying to figure out through the process of transcription a kind of a divination. You know, what it, where's the spirit? Where's the soul? You know, how is it expressing itself? Much of it comes out in the bowing patterns, you know, complicated mm -hmm. patterns, sometimes syncopated, that are the sort of magic subtext of the music, not the tune, but, but the magic that surrounds the tune and gives it its, its particular human flavor. And so transcription was my way of trying to get at that. And I'm still doing that. I think that's, that's a lifelong challenge. Uh, so I'll stop there. No, thank you. That, that's very nice. Um, we have half an hour. I think we're fine. I think we can do it. No big deal. The fourth and final question, the way I had originally uh, framed it, let's just put it in the singular to make sure we have enough time because we really have to get everybody's voice for the record. So let's put it in the singular and say, was there a chance encounter or an accidental, a chance event, or an accidental encounter that forwarded you, your career. So just put it in the singular, that way we get a chance to get everybody's voice in. Mm -hmm. Alan, we'll just okay. we'll stay with you and come back this way. Well, I, I, in my listing of people that were great influences, I didn't mention Henry Reed, partly because I was sort of saving him up for this. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as a storyteller, I'm glad I get to do this last. But, Meeting Henry Reed, the fiddler who 
was my greatest influence musically and in many other ways spiritually uh, was a chance encounter. There's a sense in which much of field work, the magic of field work is the chance encounter. So I don't want to act as if there's not lots of chance encounters in field work. But uh, Karen and I were visiting, uh, well, I met a fiddler named Oscar Wright at Galax, maybe in 66, the Fiddler's Convention in southwestern Virginia. And uh, uh, Oscar was playing some neat tunes, and I thought, wow, I had already been recording fiddlers for a good while, but I had never heard any of these tunes, you know. So I, said, I asked him, uh, would there be a chance for us to come and visit you? And he said, sure. He lived in Princeton, West Virginia, and so uh, Karen and I went to visit uh, Oscar, and we, uh, we recorded him. He's an interesting guy, an old railroad man with the Virginian Railroad. And uh, uh, he, uh, he said, uh, yeah, I asked him, well, who did you learn these tunes from? And he said, old man Henry Reed. Mm -hmm. Well, somehow I thought, well, maybe this is somebody from his youth that has long since passed away. And I must have said something to that effect. And he says, oh no, last I heard, he's still alive. And Oscar was in around 70 or so, but uh, Henry Reed, it turns out, was in his early 80s. And uh, uh, so I, it was an eye opener to me. So I went and I got directions to get to Henry Reed's house in Glen Lynn, Virginia. And uh, Karen and I drove down there. Uh, we knocked on the door. It was about five in the afternoon. And uh, Henry Reed answers the door himself. And, and I said, Oscar, we had visited Oscar Wright. And you, uh, he told us about you and said you played a lot of great, really old tunes that nobody else played. And, and, and we, we had recorded him, but I wondered if I could come and visit you. <laughs> he says, sure, come on in. And he ushers Karen and me into a big country kitchen in the house where there's eight or ten people already sitting there, <laughs> you know, ready to start uh, dinner. Uh, they had an early country dinner, you know, and uh, so Henry Reed says, well, sit here and here, and, and we sat down, and, and people talked to us and chatted, and the food was served and passed around, and, <laughs> and about 10 or 15 minutes into supper, I realized you know, this is all very friendly and everything, but they don't know who I am or why I'm here. You know? <laughs> and, but they were being polite. They, they know these things have a way of revealing themselves <laughs> in their own good time. And, and so meantime, you chat about whatever else you chat about, you know. And, uh, so then we adjourned to the, a, a parlor uh, next to the kitchen and we went into the parlor and I said, would you mind if I recorded you? And he said, no. So I went out and got the tape recorder and cranked it up, plugged it in. And uh, mm -hmm. this was an old fashioned reel to reel tape recorder. And uh, he played the first tune he played. It was a tune I had never heard. It was not one of the tunes Oscar Wright had played for me. It also was a tune what Henry Reed would have called in the minors, meaning it had a kind of a minorish cast to it in its scale. And it knocked the socks off me. And I thought, I had this feeling, it sounds schmaltzy and romantic to say it, but I had this feeling at that moment, my life is about to change. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, he played that evening recording before we finally threw in the towel, 40 tunes or something like that. And every time I went back, there were many more tunes. Uh, the, the, the only thing that interrupted the flow of great tunes was his passing away. We'll never know how much he might have offered to us, but as it is, I recorded like 144 different tunes from him. And some tunes 
on multiple occasions, which was always interesting because then you could compare one version on one day with another version on another. But that was my first encounter with Henry Reed, uh, sort of a back door finding my way to his house and finding my life suddenly changed. Anybody? Well, I'll follow on Alan because um, my chance event took place in 1973, almost exactly 40 years ago. Uh, I had graduated from college earlier that year and I had been working in a craft store in Maine, which was great fun, but it really, you know, whatever a career was, I knew that wasn't where I was going to stay. So uh, I gave myself um, three weeks to go back to Washington. I wanted to stay in Maine, so my, my deal with myself was uh, I was going to go down back home to Washington to see if I could find a job, and uh, if I didn't, then I'd go back to Maine and back to the craft store and see where life led me. Well, I went back to D.C., and the first place I went, uh, I had a contact who fixed me up with the director at the Folger Shakespeare Library, which was very much in line with what I had been doing academically, and I had a nice honors thesis with good advisors under my belt, and they had a fellowship program, and uh, it was pretty much offered to me. It was a one-year thing, but it, it, it was really very promising. And I left the Folger Shakespeare Library, and those of you who know DC know the layout. Um, I crossed the street to the Library of Congress, uh, and I knew the location of the archive, then the archive of folk song, because as a teenager, I had sneaked in frequently underage, again, like the bars, and uh, <laughs> Joe Hickerson had not kicked me out, and I had been allowed to listen to the recordings in the uh, listening room and reading room. And I found this guy named Alan Jabour, <laughs> uh, whose hair was completely black then. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, I don't believe he'd been there for long at that point. Well, but I was, got there in 70, no, I got there in 69. Oh, okay. Yeah, you'd been there a while. Um, I was an old timer. You were an old timer. <laughs> And, and Ed Waters had taken over, I think, by that time in the, well, in that, the music yeah, department. That was late. But, yeah. Um, I said, so I have this bachelor's degree in folklore. Can you imagine? Um, you want to hire me? <laughs> <laughs> and I had radio experience, so I was very comfortable with recording equipment. And there had been an issue with uh, appropriate assignment of the ethnographic recordings in the recorded sound section uh, to people who could appreciate their value because they were, as I remember, they were kind of being doled out as a punishment. You know, if you did a bad job, you then you'd got to, you got to do ages of Aunt Molly Jackson, <laughs> which, uh, which sounded great to me. So uh, Bob went, uh, Alan went down the hall and grabbed Bob Carneal, who was the, uh, at that point, the, the head of the recorded sound section and they had a position open for a preservation technician. And Bob took me uh, to the hiring office, the personnel office, to help me fill out my 121. And uh, a few weeks later, I, I kind of stalled with the Folger. A few weeks later, I got a call from Alan, and he said, you haven't taken another job, have you? Because uh, it had come through. And right about this time of year in uh, 1973, I started at the Library of Congress, and the medieval studies and Renaissance studies was, for me, the road not taken. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, okay, I'll go, and then uh, Jeff. Um, there, I think everything in my uh, life as a folklorist has been a cha chance encounter, actually. <laughs> you couldn't plan these things. I mean, they just happen. Um, but one that's really great is that when I did go down to Western Kentucky, as I said, it was a brand new program, but they did inherit a huge um, archive with, and um, wonderful stuff in there, but they were continuing to, to gather more and more materials, and they were trying to build up the archive, and I had a job as the, um, as kind of a, 
uh, assistant in the archive uh, with Lynn Montel, and he brought me in the office. He says, you know, I got a call from this guy who's out in Drake, Kentucky, in the middle of nowhere, and his name is Freeman Kitchens, and he's the postmaster, but he's also the, he's the uh, head of the original A.P. Carter family fan club, and he's been that for a long, long time. So he said, could you go out and talk to him and go see what he's got, you know? So I got in my pickup truck and I went out to Drake, Kentucky, and literally Drake is like a crossroads in the middle of nowhere with a post office general store and, and a church. And, um, and Freeman lived it, like kind of right uh, as part of the, the store was here in his house. He was still living with his mother. You, you know Freeman. And, and went in and his house was just floor to ceiling recordings of everything the A.P. Carter family ever, ever recorded, as well as interviews with all of the members, of, you know, with Sarah and Maybell and A.P. and, and with all of these uh, transcriptions of the, um, the Del Rio, Texas uh, radio recordings and whatever. And so I ended up actually going out there um, for weeks on end, you know, going out and interviewing him and seeing what he had and, and talking to him about getting the collection over to Western, which, um, which was able to be, uh, you know, we negotiated that eventually, but that ended up being my, uh, my thesis. My master's thesis was the original, like the, the sources for song of the A.P. Carter family. And so, um, so that kind of got me launched. <laughs> Freeman still asks about you. He does? Yes, he does. Oh, I've got to go down to Drake. I saw him a couple of, a couple of months ago. Oh, great. That was a long time ago. 1974, maybe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's there so many very interesting convergences on, on this. I hope that all of us get a chance to have a meal together or something and <laughs> well, at least talk a group about hug it. Now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for instance, uh, I came to sustainability not only through uh, Oscar Chate and Lawrence Hin Hinkle uh, and their influence in ecology, but I began being an organic gardener in the 1960s, and so I had a kind of hands-on experience with that, and I've, I've also never stopped that. Uh, so, um, but And there are many chance encounters. Uh, uh, Sandy Ives, who uh, was... Uh, such a, a wonderful uh, um, fieldwork partner and friend of mine even had a theory of serendipity. He called it serendipity. I think he may even have read a, uh, a paper at a folklore conference about the importance of serendipity in, in fieldwork. And I could mention a chance encounter with Archie Green mm -hmm. in 1969, which was very uh, 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 important to me. But I took the word career seriously in, in this uh, um, question. I was so totally innocent of career when I was a graduate student that when I had decided to write my dissertation on, on blues music, my uh, um, American Studies program advisor came to me and said, have you seriously considered the academic consequences of such a decision? <laughs> and I had no idea what she meant. <laughs> I thought that what she meant was, uh, you know, um, um, have you considered the good consequences? <laughs> <laughs> because I thought I was you know, going to make a contribution to knowledge, an original contribution to knowledge, and that this was a good thing, and that you know, everything would take care of itself. I would be hired to uh, get a, you know, a job I wanted, and so on. I had no idea of careers, networking, how to do any of that. And uh, my chance encounter actually was, was uh, uh, with a number of people, including Henry Glassy, that I want to mm -hmm. talk about. Um, some of my friends suggested that because at that point I, I didn't want to teach in a music department, I wanted to teach in an English department. I didn't think that people in music departments thought about ideas or talked about them. And so I wanted a job in, a, in an English department and, and uh, some of my friends convinced me to go to a regional uh, uh, MLA, the Modern Language Association conference. I was still writing the dissertation and immersed in, in blues culture at that time. and. Most of the presentations were on English and American literature, but there was one on folk music at this, and Henry uh, Glassy was one of the uh, speakers. 
I don't know whether Henry would remember this or not. Uh, it'd be interesting to know. But he he read a paper about about blues, yeah. and uh, uh, afterwards, after he was finished with the paper during the Q and A, I stood up and and uh, asked him a question. We had a nice conversation uh, about it, and um, before I could leave the room, Dick Wentworth, who I hadn't known, but he was at that point the uh, editor in chief of of um, the University of Illinois Press, came up to me and said. Uh, are you writing anything on blues? <laughs> I said, well, it just so happens I am. And he said, well, we're starting a new series, Music in American wow. Life, and, and uh, I'd love to see your dissertation when it's, uh, uh, <laughs> when it's done. Uh, and wow. I said, well, my goodness, you know, of course. Uh, uh <laughs> and so this fell right into my pattern of thinking that, you know, <laughs> good work would be its own reward. <laughs> and that was my chance encounter. I guess with both Henry and uh, and Dick, I sent the dissertation uh, when I was done. Judy McCullough read it, uh, mm -hmm. sent me 15 pages of single-spaced comments, written on <laughs> canary yellow paper, uh, and, and typed comments. Yes, and so uh, that was uh, <laughs> that was career. <laughs> And I have to throw in that my chance encounter with Archie Green was when I spilled a beer on him in 1973. <laughs> that was how I met Archie. Once again, the topic of beer comes up in this uh, yeah. Um I just want to say how wonderful it has been. And if I had a, what I want to do at this moment is just pay, take this recording and listen to it all over again. I just thought it was so interesting to get to know these, not only these individuals, but what they represent in terms of a moment in the history of our discipline when these possibilities were open. And, and thank you for paving the way for the rest of us who are following in your steps. Um, I also want to say that when I was putting together this particular panel with a focus on music, I had emailed Judy McCullough and asked her to be on it. Mm. And she said she didn't think she would make the AFS, and she has passed away. So that's, it's great for us to remember her mm. here as well. Now, the good news is we have been able to get through and we have 10 minutes left. So everybody got in, everybody um, is on, you know, got, got their chance, and we have 10 minutes. So this is a nice chance for those of you brave souls that have been sitting here listening. If you have a question for any one of our panelists, this is a nice opportunity. Do you, whoever wants to take that Well, uh, I think Jim wanted. <laughs> this is a question to Alan, easily answered. You used a phrase when you were talking about style, the something that surrounds, the, was it the magic that surrounds the tune? Yeah, that, I think that's what I said, but that was impromptu, and so... So we'll have to consult the archive here. Nothing, to, nothing, to, nothing but, wrong about impromptu. That uh, that burned itself in my mind, and I will happily steal it. Thank you. And use it. And Erica, would you please, sometime later, tell me what you think I said, because I don't recognize it at all. <laughs> That's your brilliance, Jim. <laughs> Jim Deutsch. Yeah. Uh, my question is also for Alan. Just a, a clarification uh, to sort out the sequence between working for the folk arts program at the NEA and the Library of Congress. Because you said that you went to the Library of Congress from UCLA. Was yeah. NEA in between? Library? No. I went to. In 69, I, I came to, from UCLA to the Library of Congress as head of the archive of folk song, it was then called, or, and, yeah, archive of folk song. Then I went to the Arts Endowment in 74 and started up the grant giving program in uh, folk arts. And then in 76, the legislation creating the American Folklife Center was passed, so I went back from the uh, Arts Endowment to the Library of Congress. So. Another question? Is that 
This is a great talk show, by the way. Um, so I, I guess it's, this is a, a broad question. I think that um, I'm struck <clears throat> in hearing you tell your stories about how you found your way into what others might call a career. Um, uh, it seems that you almost felt your way through the world and that opportunities presented themselves to you and you seized them. Um, and I wonder if, I don't know, I wonder if, if you see that that is a possibility for uh, the kind of the, the generation that's coming out of grad school now. Um, it seems like we could probably benefit from that a little bit. But do you see that as, as being a path? And if so, yeah. what are some of the opportunities? Well, I have to say, you know, there is kind of this little folklore of the field that somehow there were all kinds of opportunities that we were presented with when we came out of school, which is not true. I mean, I told you about that summer. I was up in Albany, New York, sending out resumes and getting rejection after rejection. Um, there are so many, I see so many opportunities now that we never had, I mean, there was no public sector folklore, first of all, in 1976 when we were first coming out. It was just beginning, and there were no, uh, there were no positions available in the academy either. So uh, many people went into other things like museum studies, and you know they infiltrated. And I think that the beauty of being a folklorist is that you can pretty much put your training to use in many different settings and it just depends on what you know either it's the chance encounter that you know you're presented with you know a museum that needs somebody or in the case of Erica oh you know don't you need somebody to work here well as a matter of fact we need a preservation technician but you could go in a lot of different directions and and really make uh, a wonderful career I think we've asked these panelists to reflect back on back in their past, and let's use Cliff's question as the final thing what, to reflect on the future. So why don't the rest of you answer a question in terms of where is the future mm -hmm. from your perspective? Erica, where are you going to Erica? dive <laughs> in there? Yes, I do want that. Yeah, that's fine. Um, well, I think in a way, the, the, the previous question ties in with the future. Uh, when you have the kind of training and the kind of worldview that we have, uh, that we've been gifted with uh, through our teachers and, and our mentors, um, I always think of my, my dad's favorite phrase. He was, uh, he was a consultant to the RAF during World War II, so he was around recon people a lot. And uh, he always used to say, no reconnaissance is ever wasted. And I love that. I want that carved on my gravestone. Um, I, I don't, I, I think that the, the areas of possibility may be different now, but what's always amazed me in my life as a folklorist is how things that I started doing not as a folklorist, for example, the medical work, eventually got folded back in the, because the more I thought about it, the more it was exactly what I had been trying to do all along, but in a different sense in you know, tying up the, uh, the strings and, and connecting the dots in the way that I always had as a folklorist, but in a different realm. Well, uh, as some of you know, I have two heads because I wear two hats as an ethnomusicologist and as a folklorist, and so my uh, sense of the, of the future has to do with both of these. I directed a, a program, a doctoral program in ethnomusicology for nearly 30 years, and uh, some of the graduates of that program uh, are working in, in uh, uh, public folklore right now. One is right here in the room uh, <laughs> with us, and and uh, it's. Uh, I, I'm I'm optimistic. I I think that uh, the most important thing. I think that. Hemingway said the most important thing was to last and to get your work done. And once, once, you, once you know what your work is, um, I think that somehow both you find it, it finds you, and, and you, find a way to, uh, you find a way to do it. I'm not trying to say that one should not take advantage of opportunities or, or create them. Uh, but I don't, I don't feel like a lot is gained by obsessing over, over them. And I, I, um, 
people who know me well know that I'm, I'm very ambivalent about the professionalization of, uh, of ethnomusicology and uh, the professionalization of graduate school and all the pressures on, on students that I think come too soon. Uh, and there's, there's plenty of time for, for that. Uh, it's more important to find out what your work is and get started on it. Mm -hmm. I'll second that, uh, and I'll point out that though my first job was an archive that already existed, and well, UCLA was the first job, and that already existed, and, and the archive was my second job, and it already existed. But the next two jobs that I had, which were really the, the, the in a way, the, where I felt I contributed something in this world in this veil of tears is, is uh, were jobs that didn't exist, you know, uh, at the time I was in graduate school or even up to the time that I took them. And, and so I think many of us, this isn't unique to me, many of us in our field, you know, have created jobs uh, somewhere. It's not just that we filled them, you know, uh, our persona combined with some need created a job. And, and so I, I feel optimistic and I feel that, that pursuing your heart and what's deepest in your spiritual concerns, you know, in your mind and in, in everything else uh, will lead to something. And, and we can't foresee what that something will be but we'll all be the better for it. Alan, I remember when, uh, it must have been 1974, you wandered into John Howell's office and you said, so, what would you do if you had a million dollars or so to give away to folklorists? <laughs> and, and you had already begun to articulate the idea of the uh, state folklorists. Um, that was, you know, for me that was like, looking at that as like history in the making. Thank you very much, Alan, Jeff, Erica, and Peggy. Thank you not only for participating in this panel, but I think I can speak for everybody in this room. Thank you very much for the contributions you've made for our discipline and for your careers. So thank you very much. Are we going to do a hug now? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, the hug. And I had already written down serendipity. Oh, oh, you got it. Uh, group hug. <laughs> group hug. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.